Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So today I am back to do my wrap up for the books that I read in the first half of April and it's gonna have to be very similar to my March wrap up where I try and speed through these reviews as quickly as possible because I read 11 books in the first two weeks of April and I have no idea how I did that. And it has been a bit of an up and down reading month. I've got a DNF, I've got some two stars, but then I've also got some like pretty solid four stars as well. Nothing that hit the heights of a five star for me, but that's okay. There's still plenty of time left in the month. First off, the one DNF that I did have this month, I was quite sad to have to do because it is one of the books on the Women's Prize for Fiction long list, and that is Build Your House Around My Body by Violet Cooper Smith. This book follows two separate timelines, two women living in Vietnam who through the course of the book end up disappearing without a trace. What I didn't realize going into this book that there was going to be so much of like a speculative magical realism element which is uh, uh, to be honest not my favorite thing to read about. I'm generally not a massive fan of magical elements in what is otherwise quite a contemporary book so it did kind of lose me there. I also just was finding it hard to make connections to these two stories. It was progressively getting weirder and weirder and I was only like a quarter of the way through when I was thinking mm, it's time to put this down. I don't think this is a book that's for me. I will say I found the 2011 plot line the most interesting but then there did come a point where even that lost me so unfortunately I did end up DNFing this. Next up I'm going to show both of these books back to back because they are from the same collection even though they are not from the same author but I do have a lot of the same thoughts about them and these books are from the British Library Women Writers series. It's a series that I've been quite keen to pick up because they just look really interesting. It's kind of modern classic female writers who maybe are very popular but maybe these particular books are not so popular and haven't quite had their due. However I'm not really off to a great start with these because I found both of these books just to be a bit meh, a bit uh, okay. And they were Father by Elizabeth von Arnhem as well as Tea is So Intoxicating by Mary Essex. Both have really interesting premises and I mean I do think Tea is So Intoxicating is maybe one of the best titles so far this year. And I think something that is quite typical of books written in this time period, especially by women writers, is that there is just this kind of wit and humour and commentary on social manners and social norms that I do find really enjoyable. I feel like the first chapters of both of these books would definitely have hooked me in. However, for me it was a case where those first few chapters just just didn't sustain, the momentum didn't sustain throughout the rest of the book and I did end up feeling a little bit bored by the end. I didn't always find the plots to be very focused, I wasn't really sure how we got from A to B. This is obviously oversimplification time and me completely generalising, but I do tend to find that a lot of books that are written kind of between 1920 and 1960 just lose me. I don't know what it is about the writing style, I don't know if I'm just having really bad luck with these books, but I never seem to like books written in that kind of 40 year period. I don't know what it is, if you've got books written in that time period that you think I might like, then do hit me up but so far just eh. Father is all about a young woman who has recently found out that her father is getting married, getting remarried. She's in her 30s and has never been really allowed to leave his side but with this new wife she's starting to think "Ooh, a bit more freedom. Whilst he's on his honeymoon she goes out in search of a new home, she starts to find love but also still ends up having to deal with her relationship with her father who just won't let go of her. Tea is So Intoxicating is about this small town in which a couple decide that they are going to set up a tea house and this is quite a controversial decision. You're very much getting into small town politics, people trying to manipulate each other into getting what they want. It's a very interesting cast of characters, though I wouldn't say I particularly latched onto anyone in here. Next up we have a bit of a different book. We have A Series of Unfortunate Events, the fourth book which is The Miserable Mill. We are firmly getting away from the stories that I know from A Series of Unfortunate Events because I only really know the stories from the original film of Jim Carrey. So this was all brand new territory to me. As I say, I've never read A Series of Unfortunate Events in its entirety. And you know, this was standard A Series of Unfortunate Events fare. The children have now been adopted by the owner of a factory. The factory does not treat its employees well. They're only allowed to eat chewing gum as a meal. They get like five minute breaks. It's very dangerous. Definitely clear commentary on working conditions and terrible bosses. And it's not long before Count Olaf does make his appearance on the scene, but of course in disguise. I'm not overly attached to this series, I can kind of take or leave it, but I have been picking them up as and when I see them in charity shops. I believe the next one is the Austere Academy, so you know, school narrative? Maybe that setting will be appealing to me? I don't know. Next up we have another Women's Prize longlist book which is The Bread the Devil Need by Lisa Allen Agostini. This was a really interesting book which is dealing with domestic abuse. We've got the main character of Alethea who is feisty and fashionable, however she is currently living with her boyfriend who is incredibly abusive both mentally and physically 
obviously. And even though all of the people in her life know that this is going on and are constantly offering her ways out, she is very much stuck, as many people often are in these abusive relationships, and just doesn't feel like there is a way out for her. And she almost feels like she deserves the abuse that she gets. However, at one point in the book, she ends up seeing firsthand a woman being murdered by her ex-lover and realizes very quickly that this could also happen to her. And so the rest of the book is playing out where you are just hoping and hoping that she is going to break out, that she is going to find a solution and find the motivation to leave her abusive boyfriend. This was a really interesting one. I really love the perspective in here. I loved Alethea as a character. As I say, you're constantly just rooting for her and wanting her to do well. However, one area that I found quite mixed about this was this commentary on how easy it is easy, in quotations, to get out of abusive relationships. One of the things that people are constantly saying to Alethea is that, you know, you don't own a home with this man, you're not married, you don't have children, it's so easy for you to get out. And Alethea is constantly being presented options and freedom. So for example, she ends up meeting her estranged brother who reveals to her that one of their relatives left them a house and because he's a priest, he can't take that house. So Alethea now has a house that she owns, she owns real estate now. She has an old school friend who wants to move back to Trinidad to set up a boutique, a wedding boutique, and wants to recruit Alethea. So Alethea now has potential for a new business venture. And I felt like it was very much being presented like the only thing in Alethea's way is herself. And I just kept on thinking to myself, well, what about all of those women who do not have options like that? If I was reading this, what what would I think? To give the major spoiler for the end of the book, so if you don't want to hear that, you know, carry on with the video. The way that Alethea ends up getting out of this relationship is that her boyfriend ends up being shot by police and he dies. Up until that point, Alethea has constantly push back against it and though she knows that she should leave she doesn't and I don't know not everybody has that option of somebody just coming along and deus ex machina killing abusive boyfriends. Season four Villanelle just does not exist in this world to do that for women. And I didn't know, like, is that meant to be the point? That the extreme way out is the only way out? That it's either death of the boyfriend or death of her? At the same time, having an ending where it would be a big epiphany for Alethea, her suddenly realizing what she has to do to get out of this relationship would also have felt a bit disingenuous. And I imagine if I was reading this, would that then be a message of, come on women, just pluck up the courage and leave. Just do it. It's not as easy to do that. So I don't know, maybe the commentary is that sometimes you need outside forces to finally step in because it does seem like a lot of people in Alethea's life know that the domestic abuse is going on and they don't actually step in to help. Some of them may even offer to call the police, but they never actually do anything. It's only when the abuse becomes very, very public in a way that people can't avoid that anyone steps in. Maybe I'm turning myself around on this. I, I don't know. It was a great book. But like I say, it did seem to wrap itself up very, very neatly in a way that I didn't always feel was very realistic. Though I'm very happy for Alethea, I just kept thinking it's not that simple. Next up we have Fanny by Rebecca F. John. This is one that I read on the way to London Book Fair. If you see my vlog about London Book Fair, you basically all of the thoughts that I had on this are the same, so I will link those full thoughts down below. This was a retelling of Les Mis Her from the perspective of Fontaine, though with a bit of a twist. Some of the plot points in Les Mis do not necessarily match up to what ends up happening, particularly in the ending of this book. As I say, I thought this had beautiful writing, but some of the plot details I didn't always think rang true. There were also some details with age and year that I thought were just not right. Didn't really fit with the canon of Les but I am a petty nitpicky Les fan, so. But like I say, if you do want to hear my full thoughts on this, I will link the timestamp to when I start talking about it in my London Book Fair vlog. Next up, we have a non-fiction history. This is Beneath the Night, How the Stars Have Shaped the History of Humankind by Stuart Clark. Very different book for me, kind of a history of science. And this is basically going from the Stone Age to the present day and our relationship to the night sky and what we were able to see there and what it means to us, how scientific advancements have changed how we view the night sky and how that impacts on society and culture and religion. This was a really interesting book. Like I say, this kind of more science-based history is not one that I typically read, but I didn't find this to be inaccessible at all. I think it was a pretty straightforward read. This is a really interesting lens to view history of humanity. That being said, I also didn't feel like there were any revelations in this. There are no moments with this history where you're thinking, oh, I wonder how this is going to impact people. It's all pretty straightforward, which, you know, is no bad thing. There are no big surprises in here. It's just an interesting story that is very well told. Next up, another book that I'm gonna kind of tease you on, and I'm not gonna give my full, full thoughts on here is The Appeal by Janice Hallett. The reason I'm not going to give my full thoughts for this right now is because this was the book club pick for the I Should Have Read That book club and we will be doing a live show for this. Probably knowing my editing timing right now uh, it's going to have 
already been and gone, that live show. So I will link that down below. But if by some miracle I manage to get this video up before then, it is going to be on Wednesday the 27th of April. Be there or be square. Next up we have another non-fiction history and that is Power and Thrones by Dan Jones. Look at this chunky chunky boy. A new history of the Middle Ages. This was one that I tried to read ahead of going to a talk for Oxford Literary Festival with Dan Jones as well as Richard Barber talking about their two books Power and Thrones and Magnificence respectively which discuss the Middle Ages. Despite its chunky chunky size I think this offers a really insightful introductory like whistle stop tour off many different places in the Middle Ages and how political power and influence evolved, changed throughout the thousand years time span. It's set out into 16 chapters, four parts, and goes in a vaguely chronological order, but is focusing on different powerful groups. So we have Romans, Barbarians, Byzantines, Arabs, Franks, Monks, Knights, Crusaders, Mongols, Merchants, Scholars, Builders, Survivors, Renewers, Navigators, and Protestants. I felt like it was split up really well. There's a great balance between different countries. You know, it's a medieval history that is not just talking about Britain. Huzzah! And what I love about that is that you're able to really see the interconnectedness between these different countries. I think especially for England, the Middle Ages is depicted often as this time where we don't really interact with other countries unless it's to fight with them, which is not true. And that was an aspect I really liked about this book. I think this is a really good reference point, a really good introduction to this history. Because of the fact that it is so chunky, you'd be thinking, an introduction? Really, Charlotte? But I promise you, there is, I don't think there is anything in here that is inaccessible. It's just maybe one that you'd want to take your time with. I think it would be a really great jumping off point for learning about these different figures in more detail later down the line. I think if you pick up a book like this, you're going to probably latch on to some figures more than others, to some centuries more than others. It's a great one for filling in gaps in your knowledge, which I definitely have when it comes to the medieval period, like early medieval is not my bag at all. So I'm really, really pleased that I read this and I would heartily recommend it. And then last but not least, I have two books by the same author, which I really, really enjoyed reading. One True Loves, as well as maybe In Another Life by Taylor Jenkins Reid. These are both backlist books by Taylor Jenkins Reid that are just being published now in the UK for the first time. Two of the books that she published prior to her more famous books, Stacey Jones and the Six and The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. These are a little bit more grounded, not talking so much about fame. These are just lovely, lovely, stories. In One True Love she's got the main character of Emma who we basically see from her teenage days into I believe her late 20s early 30s. We see how as a late high schooler she ends up falling in love with Jesse who goes on to become her husband. They have a great relationship which is based around travel, this general sense of wanderlust, wanting to explore the world and break out from their small hometown. However on the day of their first wedding anniversary Jesse is reported as missing. He goes down in a helicopter accident and is presumed dead and we see how Emma is really reeling from this experience and at points is almost suicidal in her grief. In her grief she moves back in with her family, going back to this hometown that she swore that she was never going to go back to, and find so much comfort in her hometown, in working at her parents bookstore that she'd always vowed never to work in again. And she even finds a new love. She finds new love in a man that she used to know in high school called Sam. Once again we see her build up this very sweet relationship, this new life with this new lovely man, to the point where they do become engaged. But at their engagement celebration Emma gets a phone call and it's Jesse, the husband that she believes was dead actually survived the helicopter crash. What is Emma supposed to do three years on when she now has a new life and a new fiance but the man she loved and lost is now back in her life. Maybe in another life follows the main character of Hannah. She's recently moved back to Los Angeles having been a bit of a wanderer in her 20s. She's wanting to kind of settle down and get some roots and her best friend Gabby is really helping her to settle down, giving her a place to stay while she works things out for herself. She's also really keen to see her high school sweetheart. They end up reuniting at a party she goes to with with Gabby. And at the end of the night we kind of get this sliding doors narrative. We're following two different timelines. One where she does decide to stay out with Ethan and the second where she decides to go home with Gabby. The choice that she makes here end up having completely life-changing consequences. And you're really left to wonder what was the best option? Is there a best option? Are there certain things that are always meant to happen? And what are the constants in your life that will always stay the same regardless of what choices you make? It's not really a competition but I would say if I had to choose between the two books this was definitely my favourite. I really did love this commentary on what stays the same and what changes in the two narratives that Hannah goes down. When you go down these two different timelines there end up being two romantic interests in her life. Depending on what choice she made she would end up having a different relationship to her parents, a different understanding of them. But one of the things that never changes is her best friend's loyalty and commitment to her. The real like love of her life ends up being her best friend in a completely platonic sense and I thought that was really lovely. I like this idea that there isn't just one right person for you, there is just a person that 
you happen to meet at a certain time and you make a commitment to that person. Love can come in different forms, but as I say, it is the commitment that you make to a particular person rather than your true love being a destiny, which is also kind of a similar theme in One True Loves. I think I mentioned in my reading vlog that I found One True Loves to be a little bit, not a slog to get through at the beginning, but I found myself having to kind of find my feet with this main character and with the narrative and the story that she was telling. I think I remember saying that I thought this was a little bit less accomplished, it was a little less tight than Taylor Jenkins Reid's books usually are. And for me that was mainly in the beginning, it was mainly in the setup of this slot and these characters. But once I felt like she had found her feet and I did realise where the story was going, I felt like I was racing towards the end and I was really enjoying it. Whereas this for me felt a bit more of a consistent book, it felt more on par with the Taylor Jenkins Reid books that I've already read. And yeah, I really really enjoyed both of these two books and I will definitely be going back to more of her backlist if Simon and Schuster want to publish more of these anytime soon, I would not say no to them. I just really love Taylor Jenkins Reads. I love her way of writing characters. I think in her later books she talks much more about fame, but I think this goes to show she can write just like nice, calm, contemporary romance with characters who are not, you know, fantastical, who are not these like megastar famous people and it still is really successful. So there we go, those are all of the books that I read in the first half of April. Quite a lot to get through, but I managed to get through this video in just under 35 minutes. So win for me, woohoo! Do let me know if you've read any of the books that I've spoken about today and what your thoughts were about them. Alternatively, let me know about any other books that you've been reading this month. I would love to hear from you. I hope you're having a fantastic, fantastic day, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, bye!